Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to another episode of the Florida State College University College of Law Black Alumni Network, Band TV. That's Band TV. Hopefully, you've been joining us on our previous episodes. We are here once a month, the second or Thursday, third Wednesday of each month. We have an illustrious alumni to join us here on Band TV to talk about their journey, give us a few gems and lessons um, in the on their, on their careers. Today, um, we have on Band TV an illustrious alumnus from Florida State University College of Law. She's a Gator, she's a Rattler, she's a Seminole. She's gonna tell us which one is her favorite. We will see she has gone from law student to professor, litigator, before she was a professor, and from professor, and she's now about to become a minted dean at the University of Illinois Chicago School of Law after this summer is over and she's finished up with her tenure in Boston. Please welcome to Band TV, none other than attorney, professor, and soon to be Dean, Nicola Booth. Welcome to Band TV, Nikki, great to oh see my you. Goodness. So good to see you, Marlon. Thank you so much for the welcome and thank you for that introduction, except for one part. I don't know if I can say here what my favorite of all those were. They all had such a blessing at some point in my life. So I don't want to start any trouble early in yes. the world. No, no, we're Band TV, we are always starting trouble <laughs> um, under, the, under the leadership of our president, Celicia Gordon-Smith and the rest of the, band, um, the Black Alumni Network, all the alumni out there, a few hundred of us um, mm -hmm. since um, our law school started in 1966. Uh, we certainly want to welcome you to talk about starting some trouble. Um, but before we get into that part of the journey, Nikki, mm -hmm. um, some of the folks may not know you, um, may want to just talk a little bit about, um, before you got into this law school journey, tell us a little bit yeah. about your family background and personally, um, how did you arrive at the University of Florida um, to start your undergraduate? Yeah, sure. Thanks again for having me. And it's, it's even more of an honor because we were classmates and we went through that uh, dare I say, hazing period of what law school is like together, <laughs> whether the Intr storm and- Introduction, introduction. Yes, <laughs> introduction, exactly. So it's really nice to, to be here with you as the interviewer. So yes, yeah, so you know, I was born in probably the most beautiful Caribbean island. Uh, you might agree, Marlon. So I was born- You may in agree. <laughs> you may agree. And um, we moved to the, you know, had a wonderful life there, but my parents, like a lot of um, parents from different islands, felt that there would be greater educational and other opportunities for my sister and I. So we came to the United States when I was 12, just shy of my 13th birthday. So we moved to New York. I went to high school in New York. And interestingly enough, because this brings me full circle, I was not feeling the snow and the ice. And I was like, this is nonsense. This right. is not the way to live. And so I, I graduated from high school early because I had that Jamaican educational background. So I graduated at 16. And so I asked my counselor to, you know, this is back in the day before the internet, right? So you right. can just go online and apply. I had to ask her to mail off and get applications for me. And of course I had applied to all the schools in New York and I was lucky enough to get accepted to a couple of really, really good schools. But I was, you know, tried, wanted to be independent. So she wrote, I said, there's gotta be a school in Florida. And so she easily could have done Florida State, Right. In Miami, it just happened to be the University of Florida application that she submitted. I had never been to Gainesville. I didn't know anything about any Gators or Knowles or Canes or anything. Right. Um, but that's how I got to the University of Florida. They gave me a scholarship. I was able to convince my parents to let me leave and go. What was that? What was that conversation like with the parents? Mummy was was mummy having that you going to No. So what was interesting was they were they had been buying stuff for me to go to college. You know, like you buy your bedding and all. I had this big trunk. You know, back in the days you had these big black trunks. You fill it with the stuff that you're going to need for college. Right. And up until maybe five or six weeks before I went away, they thought I was going to go to Columbia because they kept talking about you know I've been accepted there and you know it's right in the city. It's not too far away. It's a great school, which it is. Uh, but I was secretly just. Mm -mm, I want to go to the warmth. And so it was an interesting conversation. But, you know, my parents have always been so very supportive and encouraged me to kind of follow my own path and my own journey. And even though I was young and they were hesitant, they were confident. You know, they prayed over me and sent wow. me on my way. And they're like, if you want to come back home, come back home. But I stuck it out and was in Florida you know, for many years. You know, 
when we made the announcement um, that you're going to be joining us here on Band TV, there are a few friends from Vast Vast Prep. Oh yes, in in, in um, Eastern Kingston. You yes. know, one of the one of Jamaica's um, so prep, preparatory school is like an yes. elementary school. So some of your Vast friends were very excited that you are oh. going to. Um, tell us a little bit about the transition as a as a young person, 12, 13 years old, coming yeah. to the United States, dropped in the middle of New York. What was that like? Yeah, it, it was it was challenging. It was definitely um, not the most pleasant period of my life that I could think of. Mm -hmm. And that was because, you know, I had really been blessed to have good friends and support system in Jamaica. You know, a lot of our family was there. And we came to New York and we still had family. I didn't want to move. I did not want to move. I, what, was, I what precipitated the move? Was it just um, a, a process of the immigration, the visa becoming yeah. current, or was there political instability in Jamaica? What was political, some of the reasons? Political instability. I remember going to Voss Prep, which was kind of downtown Kingston, and I lived um, closer to like Barbican and Ligony. And just trying to drive to and from school during those times and the roads would be blocked, you know, mm. tires on fire, you know, a lot right. of violence. Um, so uh, it's not like that anymore. But, you know, that that I'm part of that precipitated that. And then my dad was a computer specialist and he got a really good opportunity in Brooklyn to go and work. So, you know, we moved. I, I didn't want to go. I, you know, cried and begged to stay. But, you know, my parents knew better and yeah. they were always really supportive. So, yeah. What lessons, what, what lessons do you think you primarily took away with you <laughs> from Jamaica that helped you yeah. to survive and to be successful um, finishing up high school and then going to the University of Florida? What would yeah. you say? So uh, a, a lot that I could talk about, but a couple of the lessons that have stuck with me was, you know, when I went to New York, this is going to sound strange, perhaps to individuals who have not, um, did not come from an island where the majority of people in leadership looked like them. So I leave Jamaica, I come to New York, and it was the first time that I had faced racism. Uh, so my introduction to racism was probably when I was about 13. And mm. then I was introduced to something that I didn't even know existed, which was colorism uh, within mm. the race. And so, you know, for me, just going through those experiences, it really kind of left an imprint on me about how critically important it is to make sure that, uh, you know, diversity isn't just a buzzword. Right. Uh, it's really important and that it's really important to make sure that people feel included and that we celebrate our differences and not use those as a weapon against each other, whether it's within, you know, the same race or in different um, marginalized groups or whatever the case may be. So that has always been very important to me to try to make sure that wherever I went and whatever I did, that there was uh, diversity, truly, uh, including diversity of thought among people and respect for differences of others and the importance that people feel really included. So to me, when people talk about DEI, it's kind of a buzzword, but it strikes to the heart of my own experiences and what I believe to be critically important for all people. Right. So that was definitely one lesson. The other lesson I learned was that in this country, I mean, anywhere, you can really do whatever you want to do if you put in the hard work, right? right? For and sure. you know, the resources that are available uh, sometimes we don't know about them. So the other thing I learned was that networking was really important. I hadn't thought about that a lot before, but once I got to high school and I was on the cheerleading squad, um, you know, I tried to get myself very ingrained in different things and it made a difference. My first job at Burger King was because my friend's dad knew somebody who was the owner, right? So, so I learned early on the importance of networking and just really always trying to be kind and generous to people along the way because uh, not only you never know when you might need them and they'll cross your path, but just because it's the right thing to do and you want to breaking, be able to do breaking, that. Breaking, breaking news here, breaking news here. We have a dean who's who was a cheerleader. So so <laughs> break that down for us. So cheerleader, were you the were the were you the one on top of the permanent oh, pyramid? Listen, or? so I was, I was, I was they call it a flyer. In high school, I was on the top of the pyramid until one fateful basketball game in New York when my base had an itch or something and she moved and I fell. Ooh, from, from, the, from the top. Yes, thankfully I wasn't badly hurt. I was definitely shook up and feeling pain. But from that point on, I was always in a split <laughs> on the floor, not on top. <laughs> and then when I went to college, I joined a dance team. So I was like, they're not putting me up on any pyramids. I'll just go out there and dance during the you know, halftime and basketball. So, so you, and so forth. you have a little, you have a little black creative in you then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's, what's your, what's your, 
what's your passion there as it relates to the arts and your creativity? Oh, it's dance. It's, it's dance. dance. I, I've danced in Jamaica uh, when I started dance at three. And then, you know, I did cheerleading because I didn't have a dance team. As soon as I got to University of Florida, I was one of the first of the Dazzlers dance squad. If I'm aging myself back in 86, what? Uh, there were very few of us. And I did that for a couple of years. And then even years later, when I, uh, well, after college, I went and I became uh, Orlando Thunder cheerleader. That was when they had the World League football team. That right. was like a different experience. I became an Orlando Predator cheerleader for a very short period of time before coming to law school. And then after I graduated and I had kids, I joined a dance ministry at church. I was leading the dance ministry for many, many years, up until not that long ago, when I probably should have stopped a long time ago. No, but. I can probably <laughs> see you probably, you're probably still dancing somewhere. Um, but when you got to University of Florida, Nikki, um, what was that transition like for you? Um, because you went from New York, which you, you, you're a fish in the pond again, and then you go yeah. to the University of Florida, yeah. uh, bigger pond, um, and you're one of few in the pond. What was that transition like yeah. for you um, in Gainesville? So, so that was interesting because I went to the University of Florida, and unlike many of my high school friends, I knew no one, like there was nobody else there from my high school. I knew absolutely no one on that campus. I had only visited it once, visited once for preview uh, when my mother was like, they don't even have dirt, it's sand down here. What is this? <laughs> the humidity was dreadful. Um, but I just, I was really lucky to get a roommate who also happens to be of Jamaican heritage. And we've become fast friends. We've been friends now. For Coincidence. A, you know, yeah. Well, you know, they ask you like your background. I think they kind of matched us up. Okay. And I, I was really, um, I like people and I like finding out about people. And so I was really lucky to have a good circle of friends. And then, of course, I joined a dance team and then I helped recruit for football and track. And I worked the athletic association. I, I worked see. in the gym. So, so I tried to ingrain myself because, again, those lessons that I had learned starting back from Jamaica going through New York about networking and how you treat people, it really does open up opportunities for you, even if you're not pursuing them yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that what was- were your, What were your rules for relationship building on campus? What, what did you do? What was your philosophy on networking mm -hmm. as an undergraduate that you probably still use some of those um, lessons and, and tips? Yeah, uh, I think at, at the root of it is, people want to be heard and everybody needs an opportunity to be heard and everybody has a story, right? And uh, just having an interest, a true genuine interest in people and their stories and um, seeing how you can help them if you can, it's always been at the root of who I am. So that was part of it. I like to hear people's stories. And then when you hear people's stories, then you start understanding, well, okay, these are relationships that you know I can be a benefit to the relationship and vice versa or some that are like okay this is this is not you know we're we're going to be acquaintances right um, so i think just really being a good listener and um a loyal person in people's lives even if you're you know not their best friend um you know i really strongly feel like consistency breeds integrity so i've always mm. tried to be consistent about who i am uh, and be kind of authentic and genuine in everything that i do regardless of what position or title that I might have. So, um. Right. You know, for our listeners that just joined us, you know, we're here at the Florida State University College of Law, Band TV. We're here with um, desig Dean Designate, um, Nikki Booth, um, who will be joining the University of Illinois Chicago School of Law. If you guys have any questions or comments, you can drop them in the chat. I'm happy to um, share the questions with um, soon to be um, Dean Booth, um, who's joined us here on, on Band TV. So Nikki, that's a word there. Consist consistency breeds integrity. Um, what were you studying in undergrad, and when did law school become a whispering manifestation in your in your mind? Yeah. So so law school. Um, when I was growing up in Jamaica, my dad, you know, he was part of this uh, social group called the JCs, and right. he and his JC friends, you know, they would sit on the veranda, the porch, and you know, have these long debates about politics, and you know. And, you know, the women would be kind of in the house. The kids would be around. I was always sitting out there, but well, not most of the time. Right. And always had something to say or some question to ask. I asked a lot of questions. Among the men. Yes. Yes. Of the men. And as I grew older, they would kind of, you know, 
engage me a little bit. Just they were really kind of humoring me. But, you know, I would, you know, have like, well, I don't know. Well, why do you think that? And I think bubble, well, whatever. They say, you know what? You should be a lawyer. They kept saying that to me. And it's to me that reminded me when I had my own children about what you speak into someone's life. So you got to be careful what you say to people. But they kept saying that I thought I wanted to be a doctor because I love everything science. Mm. But I don't like to see, see things pierce flesh. So like a scalpel or a needle. So I figured that's going to be a problem. Right. Go to med school, try to be a doctor. Uh, so that was kind of planted um, before. Uh, and then so when I went to um, college, I also, again, because of the sciences and I love sports. So I majored in exercise and sports science. And I said, oh, I can go to law school and be a sports lawyer. Oh. Sounds like I had never met one. I didn't know anyone. But right. it sounded good, right? So um, I applied to law schools. I got in. Of course, I applied to University of Florida because that's where I was. Uh, I had already... I had graduated and I was going to take a year off what they now call a gap year, but we didn't call it that. I just needed a year off. And so I worked for a law to law firm in Orlando as a everything, a runner, a secretary, uh, go grab the coffee, everything. And I was like, uh-uh, I'm going to be one of these lawyers because they're living the right life, not right. doing everything else. Um, and the University of Florida accepted me to come the following spring. And I was just ready. I was ready to go to school. And Florida State gave me just a great opportunity. Um, and I knew a couple of people who were going who were friends of mine. And so I was like, it'd be good to go where I know their support. And it's probably one of the best decisions that I ever made. Uh, and I think largely in part because of the class that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody knows our class was a little bit different. I think it was the first class that had that many um, Black students in the mm -hmm. 1L year. And I, we realized that soon and because of the bonds that we made. I mean, some of my lifelong friends, right, come, came out of that 1L class that year. And so that became a, a critical period in my life too, and especially that I was a gator and my car was blue with an orange stripe and, you know, <laughs> but um, it was such a- Riding through period. Tallahassee, right? Um, <laughs> what was your favorite, what were some of your favorite um, subjects or classes at the law school that you gravitated towards that, that, that were memorable yeah. for you. And tell us yeah. a little bit about that. So, you know, my favorite class probably was torts. And I can't think of the name of the professor. He was an adjunct. So he wasn't even a full-time professor there. I loved torts. I remember loving Professor Powell, but not liking property at all. And then my least favorite class was, um, well, two, but for two different reasons. So contracts, because I didn't like the contracts professor at all. And I don't think he liked the fact that we were there at all. Mm. But um, my study group and our close knit group were so supportive. And we were like, listen, we're going to prove to everybody that we belong here mm. and we're going to excel. And we helped each other out and we did. Um, but the least favorite class other than that, because of that situation, uh, had to have been civil procedure, which is interesting because then I taught civil procedure. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so it was interesting when I when I got the opportunity to teach civil procedure, I actually looked up my civil procedure professor. It was Professor Jean Sternlight. Mm. And I called her. I said, I have this opportunity to teach it. You're my civil procedure professor. You know, what can you and because I didn't want to have my students have the same experience that I had. And she said that that was the first class, her first day as a professor. She had never taught before. This was her first class. And I could so empathize and sympathize with that. And it made all the sense to me. And of course, now she's been teaching for 25, 26 years and she's phenomenal and she's a well-known scholar in the in the area. But yes, uh, but I wow. also had, you know, like Professor Guy for yeah, Palm Law. Guy, Palm Law right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so many professors, Professor Griffith, I worked for him as his research assistant. Yeah. Um, you know, my PR professor, it was just so many memorable. And then we had Dean Widener. So what was your formula for success in law school if you were to describe it or define it? Yeah, <sighs> I think it's the formula for success in any law school. You have to literally just commit, especially in that first year. I don't want to say sacrifice because sacrifice sounds is so sounds so harsh, but you mm -hmm. really have to commit your time, your effort, commit everything about who you are to your studies in that first year. That's the first thing. Um, I tell my first year students all the time, I'll ask them in one of the first classes, 
uh, or even when I serve in an administrative capacity and I have an audience, I ask them, raise your hand, and who was he who is here that somebody coerced you or by gunpoint made you come to law school? And other than one clown one year who raised his hand, nobody raised their hand, right? This was a free <laughs> choice that you made right. um, to come to law school. And so if you make that choice, then you understand the consequences, you understand the responsibilities, you understand the obligations that you have. And whether you're doing it for yourself or you're doing it for family members or your community or, you know, people have different reasons why they're in law school. But you had a reason. And the, the reason can't just be because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, because there are a ton of other things you could do <laughs> with your time while you're figuring out your life. But if you commit to come to law school, you have to commit that time. You have to make sure you have those conversations with family and friends so that they understand that this is a commitment. I might not be able to show up for everybody's birthday party and you know Thanksgiving, I might just come and get a plate. If I even get a plate, I can't hang out because I have right. finals, but it's gonna pass so quickly that if you can commit the time that's needed, you'll reap the benefits for a lifetime. So that's the first thing. The second that's thing- That's a powerful is, word, Nikki. That's such a powerful word in terms of the commitment and the verb commit um, in terms of affirming as opposed to sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's that's really a word right there for sure mm -hmm. um, that we can take away. For, so if you could speak to 26, 27 year, 28 year old Nikki, yeah. the law student, know that your oldest is about the same age when you were in 25. law school. Yeah, what would you say to her? Yeah. So, you know, by 25, 26, I was, I was done. <laughs> I was out, but if, but my, but as a law student, I would say to her, one, stop stressing. Just do the work and stop worrying. Stop getting too much in your own head about mm. work. You already, you know, uh, one of the things I think that is a sign of a good leader is that the one thing that a good leader always expects is the unexpected. So when things happen, you're not thrown off the rails. You're not, you know, thrown out of sync because you anticipate that things are going to happen. So when you come to law school, you expect that it's going to be a lot of work. You anticipate that it's going to be a lot of reading. You expect that you're not going to have time to do a lot of things. So if that happens, then that's already your expectation. Just walk in it. Make sure you take care of yourself. Make sure you attend to your well-being. But just walk in the truth of what law school is, especially that first year. Right. And after that, it's more stuff, right? But it's maybe not as strenuous or stressful in the classroom. But you still have other obligations. And it's three to four years out of your life, maybe five if you do it part time. And if you've already been through high school and college, three to four years is just a drop in the time of your life. So you just have to make that commitment mm. and you just kind of keep your foot to the to the pedal, as they say. What did you do in law school to take time for yourself? What was your thing to to de-stress? Yeah, I, I, I can't. You know, the first year, honestly, was quite a bit of a blur. <laughs> Uh, I did have a really good study group and you know this, we had good groups where we did, we yeah. took time and we would have little uh, social, I say we were part uh, social events. <laughs> we had social events, but we had the social events on, you know, Friday night or Saturday right. and then we were back in the library, right? On Sunday and Monday, but we took time to get to know each other, to support each other. I think that made all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. A lot of us come from undergrad only having studied alone and been successful doing that for so long. Yeah. And for law school, it I could not have, I would not be as successful as I am now. I would not have been successful as I was in law school and graduate with honors if I did not have the accountability and the other voices of my study group and the opportunities to really engage with the wider class. Uh, so I firmly believe in that and just the networking and the mentorship that came from that um, was crucially um, important. Yeah, the first year is definitely a blur. Um, I wish I would have taken a little bit more time to breathe. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, we got through it and we got through the bar exam as well. Mm -hmm. So Nikki, you enter the world of law and you start litigating. And mm -hmm. when did the idea of Professor Nikki Booth? Yeah. Who, and who, who inspired that? Mm, that is a really good question. So, yeah, so I get out, I'm litigating. I'm, you know, actually quite enjoying litigating, you know, win, lose. I still didn't mind it. Of course, it's, you know, stressful. It's the practice of law, but I was really enjoying it. And one of my study group members from law school had gone into JAG and the uh, FAMU's law school was reopening in Orlando. 
and she and her then husband were coming to be professors, uh, Phyllis Tate. So here I go, this network, again, right, this networking and the people who are in your life and how you treat people in your lives. Mm. And she was like, listen, you know, we all we both had young children. She said the schedule is great. Right. You can teach class three days a week. You might not have to come in more than those three days during the week. It's a really good schedule and the pay is decent. Right. And at that time you have young kids, you're really thinking more about the quality of life as you really should be doing the most of your life. Right. And so um, she introduced me to the dean. And one of the things I always did for my pro bono work was to represent children in the GAL system, you know, who had been allegedly abandoned, abused or neglected. And so he said, could you come over and set up the GAL clinic? Mm -hmm. So I took a sabbatical from the firm for a year and I went to the law school. Uh, And when I got there, GAL for the viewers that may not know. Uh huh. So that's the guardian ad litem. So we represent children in the dependency court system. Wow. So, um, so you started at FAMU and in, in Orlando, so you moved the family to Orlando and. No, I was already there. That's where I was well, practicing. Long. Oh, that's where you were practicing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what did you decide to, what were you, what were you, the courses that you were teaching and, and how did you choose? Um, yeah. that, that, did, did they say, we need you to teach that? Or you yes. said, I want to teach that? No, it chose me. So I'm doing, I go over just to set up the clinic, which I can do easily, right? I don't need any prep for that. I've been doing this for years. And they're like, well, you have to teach another class. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm a litigator. I'm only here to do this clinic thing. Like I can teach students how to actually like right. file some documents and draft some motions. And they were like, well, no, well, everybody teaches another class. And I was like, whoa, well, well. Um, so they gave me consumer law to teach. So, uh, when I had been on, I had taken a break between firms for one of my children when he was born. And at the time I did like this little part-time work for this uh, law firm that represented a legal, like a legal shield type company. So people can call in with any kind of question and you basically issue spot, tell them the case they have, refer them to a lawyer. So of course, a lot of the questions had been consumer law questions. So I had a little bit of background on that. So I was like, okay, fine. So I taught the class and I absolutely loved the idea of helping people on this treacherous journey of law school and seeing those light bulbs go off and really kind of making an impact. I had, you know, for years I had represented companies like Walmart, you know, it's wonderful if you win a case for Walmart, but you, I'm not really impacting anybody's life but Walmart's pocket, which, you know, is pretty well lined okay. as it already is. So this was, it was just, gave, it was so much more gratifying. So I mm. asked for another year of sabbatical from the firm and 18 years later, I'm, I, I was still teaching, <laughs> still teaching. Wait, I mean, you get asked to teach a course that you know nothing about, right? Yeah. So where did you start? I mean, law school mm-hmm. teaches you how to find information and to research, but how did you shape yourself yeah. into a consumer law professor? Yeah. So I taught consumer law for maybe like two or three years. It was just a matter of getting a book. So um, just asking other professors, you know, what book, then taking the book and like dissecting it as if I were a law, sc- law student and creating, you know, a lesson plan. Okay. Like um, and then a couple of years later, uh, I, f- I was f- almost kind of bullied, but it was such a good thing that this happened to me that the associate dean at the time was like, you need to teach a first year class. And I was like, no. I don't, I don't want to teach a first year class. <laughs> and so they gave me torts and I loved teaching torts. I saw torts for maybe 15 years. A lot of your torts students um, dropped in the chat and, and yeah. sent me DMs and said that you were one of your, your favorite professors of torts oh. because you loved torts when you were in law school. I did. What was the difference between being a student and being a professor of torts? Um, I think the difference for me was because I had practice experience was being able to throw in a couple war stories every now and then to kind of try to bring it to life as best because some of the torts cases they were reading were the same torts cases we read 25, 30 years ago, right? Some of those cases are just still in the books. And so kind of really trying to bring it to life. And then I started reading things like tort stories that would tell like the backstory Mm. of Paul's graph or, you know, the backstory of, you know, Wagon Mound. And so mm. to be able to kind of tell the story, to kind of give them an opportunity to, to personalize the people that we're talking about in the, in the, was, I loved that part of it. So. Awesome. How did you, how would you describe yourself as a professor? Uh, it depends on what class I'm teaching. Oh, really? You have different <laughs> characters? 
Uh, well, I mean, it's still me, my whole genuine self. But if I'm teaching a first year class, I understand right. that I need to convey the information to them in a different way than I do. Like right okay. now when I'm teaching my ethics and professionalism seminar, okay, like, I see. Be very relaxed and have a conversation. These are, you know, okay. young. I'm considering them young lawyers. They're about to go practice in the next few months. Right. As opposed to this is the first year, you need to stay on track. I need you to get this information. I need you to get the information that I know you're going to need for the bar. I need you to get the information to pass my exam. So I'll do a little bit more Socratic uh, with the first years that I don't do with my upper level students at all. And so, you know, try to, and also, you know, they're so like deer in the headlights the first year, which is understandable. So, but I have to kind of keep them on their toes because I need everybody to succeed. I want everybody in there to succeed. I'm not about this. Look to your left, look to your right. That person's not going to be here. And no, everybody needs to do well. So we all need to stay on track. So Nikki, you're teaching courses on professionalism, ethics, mm -hmm. human trafficking, social media, torts. Yeah. Um, you're now a visiting professor at Boston University College of Law. Um, Tell us about this new course that you're working on that you're teaching now with mindfulness and the law. Yes. Very curious about it. Where did, where, where did this course um, begin? Is, is it a yeah. new body of law? Um, yeah. Tell us about that. Sure. So many years ago, I went to a conference. It was a pretty tumultuous time in my personal life. And, you know, I was just trying to keep it together. I was on the tenure track. You know, you have to go through this process of writing and publishing articles to get tenure. It's very stressful. Um, and I went to a How conference. many articles do you have to write to become tenured? Um, uh, it varies by institution, but usually you need at least two to three, if I remember. Well, no, yeah, maybe three or four. Depending. For the year? No, no in, in general, like your body of work has body to be. Body of work, okay. Right, but right. you have a set time period, you know, like you usually have to, if you're on the track, you need to do your scholarship, do your service, uh, make sure your teaching is on track within, you know, like a four to five year period. Mm. And then if you don't, then you risk the um, the possibility of being let go from the institution. I so, see. So very stressful. And uh, I was waiting for a session to start and they were talking about, um, it was like a well-being or something in this room. And I, I had to wait. I have some time. So I walked in there and I was like, why is this even at a legal conference? It's like all this like touchy-feely stuff. And what's wrong with these people? Like we're lawyers, law professors. Let's get ourselves together. Right. Um, but something about it struck a chord. I think they did like a little mindfulness exercise that was probably five minutes. And it was hard for me to do it. But I, was, it, I felt better afterwards. And then, you know, I was teaching torts that next semester, and I'm very um, conscious of, like, people's energy. Um, mm. I tell people all the time, like, I'll give you what I get from you. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, and I went into class, and I now know that they had a memo that was due in a legal writing class. And they were just, I said, you know what, everybody's energy, I really needed it for myself, to be perfectly honest. I said, we're going to take a minute. We're going to take a minute and do like some breathing and be mindful and kind of ground ourselves. And we did it. Uh, and that was the start of my mindful minutes. Uh, when I first did it, students, you know, were like kind of how I was, why are we doing this touchy feely stuff? And as the semester goes through and I did it for many years, they start asking for it. Students graduate, they're preparing for the bar. They ask me to come do mindful minutes with them on the bar. My mindful minutes are also really grounded in gratitude for the opportunities we have as students to be students in a law school and just a reminder that you belong there. If you're there, you belong there. You've done the hard work to apply, to be accepted, to belong. Um, so to kind of just, it kind of helps, I guess, build up the confidence, but it, it's really about the truth of who we are. So that kind of evolved and then the pandemic happened. And so many of our students were struggling just like everybody else right. was. So I offered, I was on sabbatical because I had served as the, um, interim dean for about a year and a half. So I offered to do a mindfulness workshop for no credit for whoever wanted to participate. And I did. And then so when I came to BU to visit, uh, you know, again, at schools all across the country, law firms, we we're realizing the importance of well-being to the practice of law, to being a successful practicing lawyer. Right. And so I created the Mindfulness in Law course, which has been going very interestingly well. Love it. Love it. So Nikki, there's a theme here, and, and it, no, you know, I know, I know we're classmates and we know each other, but but there's a theme here 
um, of you being a risk taker and you being so fearless, you fee you making it known that you belong at the University of Florida, you making it known that you belong in the classroom as a professor, um, this whole idea of belonging, how much does that mean to you as you embark on this new fearless chapter of being a dean? Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it's critically important to me. I know what it feels like to not belong and to be excluded. And I'm more so an extrovert than an introvert. So it's, it's challenging for me, especially as a young person. I mean, now that I'm old, it's, you know, <laughs> I might not care. Now that much. you are more seasoned. More, more seasoned, more seasoned, right. <laughs> but I, I know, I know what that feels like, particularly when you have that feeling with no true basis for you to feel that way, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's in our own heads or whether it's external factors that make us feel not included. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that I answered the call to administration was because I understood that I would, it would give me an opportunity, such a rare and privileged position to be able to really kind of shape the culture and shape an environment of such a critical stage in individuals' lives. You know, law school is not the easiest thing to do. I'm sure there are other things that are difficult too, but I can only speak from our lived experience that law school can be treacherous. And well, it can be- first of all to you as, as a, um, an, an, an administrative role? How did, who inspired yeah. that? So, um, you know, I was just happy being a professor and the dean at the time uh, mm -hmm. called me to his office. And I remember going to Professor Tate, Phyllis's office and saying, I don't know, why is he, it's like going to the principal's office. I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> one eye. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I went and he said that the associate dean for academic affairs was leaving and he would like me to do the position. And I said, but I have never expressed an interest in doing administration. And he was like, well, just, you know, whatever he had observed, which is another thing. You always want to do what you're doing to excellence and not for people, right? You have to do it for yourself or some higher power and people will recognize the talents and the skills that you have. So we were going through an accreditation period. So I agreed to do it for two years. I said, I'm only doing it for two years because, you know, now I have to go back to going to work every day. And I'm used to going to work four days a week. Mm. And, you know, so um, I did and about, 15 months into my tenure as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, again, you don't know who's watching you. The provost called me. Um, he actually texted me and said, oh, you need to talk to me. And I said, well, I'm in a meeting with the then dean. And he mm -hmm. said, call me when you get done. I called him um, when I got out and he said, are you ready? And I said, oh, sure. I have some time. I can talk to you right now. Uh, what can I do for you? And he said, no, are you ready? And I said, yeah, I'm I'm ready. We can talk. And he said, no, are you? I said, okay, what's, what's going on? And he said, that's, well, that, that's, seen, that's like a, an open ended professorial kind of question. Yes. Without any context. No context. So he said, we are, um, you know, board of trustees, president, we are having a change of leadership and we want to appoint you as interim dean effective in the morning. Effective when? In the morning. So this was about I don't know, noon, one o'clock on a Monday, and I was to be interim dean at 9 a.m. the next morning. So, so what happened? I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> um, but, you know, on further conversation with him, you know, talking to Phyllis, speaking to some other, you know, mentors who I valued their opinion, um, they were going to put an interim dean in there. And if they felt at that nine o'clock task, yeah, it was going to happen one way or the other. 12 hours, 12 hours from the conversation. Yes. And so I told uh, the provost, I said, I, I will do it if you understand that I'm not going to babysit. Right. If you want me to do the job, even if it's for a short period of time, I am going to do it to the best of my ability. I'm not just going to hold the reins where they are. And You're not a placeholder. Yeah. yeah. So, so then that's what happened. That's how I... So again, I, it was not part of the plan. And then once I did that and I realized the true opportunity to make change and make impact on a wider scale and to inspire and impact and really influence more spheres of the legal community. And there's so much that we need in the legal community and to just be able to engage with alum and engage with the bar in different ways and just kind of frame how what legal education looks like, not just in one institution, but on a broader scale. Yeah. Um, I got the Dean bug, as they say. So the so. Dean bug, so hmm, what did you discover behind the curtain yeah. after 9 a.m.? 
<laughs> right. So you know how, so before, you know, I was all, I would always say, you know, if I were deemed for a date, right. this, this, that, and that. <laughs> and then you realize, you know, the limitations. And I've been a faculty member for so long and I had um, served as a faculty member under a number of deans. You're and part so of the faculty things, union. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, you know, there were things that I knew I didn't want to carry forward, but there were also valuable lessons I had learned from many of them. Um, and I, I didn't realize that deaning was so much more about managing an institution, right? Because I understood faculty life and scholarship. I understood professor life. I understood student life. I'd been a student. I even right. understood associate dean life. Right. But it was completely different. Um, you know, it's so multifaceted. There's so many different constituents. You know, every day brought a new challenge, and uh, which I what quite was, like. What were so, some of those challenges uh, that I can speak of? So, you know, you might have, you know, a faculty uh, faculty member that needs some support or needs some issue. You might have a mm. student issue. You might have a, you know, a staff issue, security issue, a IT wow. issue. Wow. Uh, and then I was deaning when you know, the pandemic changed all our lives. So Friday, March 13th, I will never forget, you know, we had to completely go to remote teaching where we had professors who used to ask staff members to turn their computers on. And so, you know, I had to leave that whole transition for everybody, for all of us, while we were all trying to, you know, figure out what was going on and how to cope. Um, but, you know, when you're the leader, you have to try to make some decisions and try to depend on the kinds of conversations and collaboration and engagement you had before to make good decisions for everybody and not just make decisions based on emotion. Uh, so. So Nikki, you and I know that in this whole world of belonging, there, there are not that many black women deans. Yeah. Across the country. Right. Um, did this play a factor for you of the, your awareness of that gap in our legal yeah. education leadership? So here's something that's actually quite amazing that I'm happy to be a part of the group now, but I am the 28th black female Dean in this country. In the past, maybe five or seven years, there has been as best we can describe it because it's not enough of us, but quite an explosion of people of color who have been serving as deans. And the, the black deans have been so welcoming and encouraging. In fact, when I, I said I wasn't going to do the dean thing, I was just going to go teach somewhere else. My kids are older. I want to go teach somewhere else. Right. And they pushed me and they encouraged me and they kept recommending me for that group. Yes. Support system. Okay. Absolutely. Is it an organization? Or is it just an informal network of? It's just an informal network. It's just an informal network. And, and frankly, though, the, the deans all across the country do have a good network. Um, but yes, there are uh, quite a few of us now, which I'm, I'm happy to be a part of. So. You know, so as we come to a close in this band TV conversation, I know the time has gone away so quickly. What's your vision for yourself um, at the University of Illinois as you as you wind up one semester in, at Boston and you yeah. hopefully maybe take a little time off or you're probably not going to have any time off? Well, how are you preparing yourself for this new chapter? Mm -hmm. And what's your vision for that law school? Mm -hmm. um, as you presented yourself to take on the leadership there? Yeah, so that's a that's a, a loaded question for the last few minutes. Um, so, you know, my, my children and I are really close. And when we make family decisions, you know, I, I like to get their input, even if I have to make the decision. For many years, it was- So kind you of had a Sunday dinner with some rice and peas and some- Yes. Rice. What did you do? <laughs> we did, we do have that, you know, some rice and peas. Now, you know, some of us don't eat meat, so we have to have all these vegetables and all that right. instead of some good, like, you know, brown stew chicken and so right. forth. But I think it's imperative, even as I go into this new leadership position, that I am I know what the way forward is. And I have grand ideas that I have shared with them, you know, part of which would include like robust um, pipeline projects and, you know, making sure that we have you know, really targeted recruiting to ensure that there is continued DEI. It's an amazing institution with so much possibility. And I get so excited when I think about all the things that I can collaborate with the faculty and the staff and the students to get done. But in order to really state a vision, it's really important to me to get input from all the constituents. So mm -hmm. when I first start in June, I'm actually going to go on what I'm calling a listening and learning tour. They have heard okay. from me. I have spoken. I was just there again last week when I got to do another kind of thank you for the opportunity and, you know, meet some alum and students and uh, other administrators, higher administrators. 
Um, but I really want to hear from all the people who are the heart of UIC Law. So I'm going to talk to faculty and staff and students and everybody so far has been amazing. Even where there are concerns and there are issues, there is such a willingness to move forward and to improve and to enhance. And it's the only public law school in the entire city. It wow. has such a unique niche and it has an evening program that can serve the needs of, you know, uh, full-time workers in the area. So it's tremendous opportunity there. I am increasingly excited to start working there. Once I get past the logistics of figuring out how to move from Boston and Orlando to Chicago um, and I get settled, it, it's going to be wonderful. I'm really looking forward to it. And I hope if there are Black alums from Florida State who are in the area, that they will reach out to me. We will, we will find Thanks. out. We will find out. Yes. Uh, we're so proud of you that you know, in terms of this new chapter. Um, but it's kind of ironic, though, Nikki. You are going in the reverse direction, back into the cold breeze. What are you going to do yeah. to fix this irony? Yeah. So you see how God has a sense of humor? Yeah. I leave New York because I'm like, I don't like the cold. And then I'm in Florida. I'm like, you know, if I go somewhere, I don't want it to be cold. And one of the, the dean here, Dean Angela Anawachi Willie, who happens to be a Black female, a friend of mine, gave me the opportunity to come here and teach civil procedure and, you know, do my mindfulness in the law class. And so I end up in Boston, of all places. And, you know, I don't know, Boston, Chicago, the weather's the same because I traveled from here to Chicago. It right. was the same temperature. It's a you know, people are like, is the water, the lake is there, but right behind my apartment in parallel to this beautiful law school here is the Charles River. So I walk and I don't have my car. Um, so I think this was my reintroducing, my reintroduction to the weather. And I don't mind it. I really don't. I'm not yeah. as intimidated by it as I think I was when I was 15. And my dad used to make me go out there and shovel the snow because I don't uh, do that okay. anymore. No, we got to the real reason. <laughs> Well, listen, it's been a real treat talking with you here on, on Band TV. Please let us know how we can support you in any way um, in terms of your your journey from law student to professor to now soon to be dean. As of June 15th, June 15th, yes. officially, you yes. won't be dean designate anymore. You'll be yes. dean Nikki Booth of the University of Illinois Chicago School of Law. Look her up, check her out. How can we, how can the viewers um, be in touch with you? Um, and to follow your work and to follow your um, leadership journey? Well, certainly, you know, friend me on all the social media. So I'm on social media, Nikki Alicia, Nikki Alicia B on Twitter and, and, and Instagram and Facebook. And then you can eat my personal email for any kind of work thing is Professor Nikki Booth at Gmail. It's easy enough. Um, but and of course, you know, I can they can always contact me through you. And I'm part of the alumni network. And I'm just so thankful to have been asked to do this because uh, the Black Alumni Network that I had at Florida State University, including my dear brother Marlon, was so instrumental in my success and where I am. So I'm truly grateful to just have this time to kind of chat with everybody. And yes, please stay engaged with me. Thank you so much, Prof the Professor Dean Nikki Booth. Thank you for being here on Band TV. Next month, the second or the third Wednesday, we would have another illustrious alumni that's going to be teaching us giving us some gems and lessons on their journey so you can tune in here. You can also tune in to our past episodes that started back in November on our YouTube channel for the Florida State University College of Law Black Alumni Network. We want to be a part of your support system and connect with you um, with your shared experiences or common values. We just want to, as I would say, big up everybody and to just be a part of um, each other's support system um, as you transition from law student to lawyer to to could be a professor, could be a dean, um, whatever your next chapter in life is. But thank you for joining us on this episode again. Nikki, stay warm. I will send some, um, what can I send for you? A nice warm pot of chicken noodle soup with some dumplings and some carrots and some scotch wine that would take care of you as well. But thank you so much. And thanks to um, for everyone for tuning in. So see you next month. Thank you. Bye, everyone.